I am Andrus Kulikowskis. This is Math for Wisdom. Today, I am uh, proceeding with an overview of wondrous wisdom, which is the philosophy of wisdom that uh, I am sharing through Math for Wisdom. And uh, this will be the second in a series uh, for this overview. The first one was um, uh, building blocks, frameworks of perspectives. It was the preliminary structures that just permeate uh, all of this uh, language of cognitive frameworks, the bottom-up view. But today I want to talk about the top-down view. You know, how does this all fit together, etc. Of course, it's tentative. But the key uh, thing to talk about will be uh, definitions of God and human. And then I think I'll be able to talk uh, about the big picture, questions God and humans investigate. So um, uh, God is just naturally important if you want to know everything, as I do, um, simply because that's a vantage point that we have uh, intuition uh, developed over centuries of what that could possibly mean, you know. How to, how to think differently. And so from that point of view, it's not so crucial that uh, God exists, uh, but simply the very possibility of God, uh, and not a God, but a comprehensive God, right? Uh, a God uh, who is the spirit of everything, able to know everything, uh, affect everything. Um, that is um, important. And... Uh, to have some personal intuition. And I think, of course, uh, that personal intuition, some of it can be at arm's length, just kind of contemplating God. But I think uh, the way our life works, uh, my life works, is uh, especially if we live on the edge, uh, which is uh, for marginal people, uh, you know, for independent thinkers, uh, we're uh, at the edge of society. We're not accommodating others. Um, we're not agreeing with others very quickly. So we're not in the center of society but we're in the predicament of the periphery. And so living on that edge and not falling off that edge, you know, uh, God can become very uh, relevant as a perspective to engage. And in as much as that is successful, you know, and in as much as we're appreciative, uh, that becomes a rather um, personal and warm relationship. So that's informing uh, my perspective. Uh, and uh, it's been about 40, of course, I've thought about these things all my life, but it's been 40 years that I've worked on this language of cognitive frameworks. I was 17 when I started. I'm 58 now. And so um, from that point of view, what I'll be doing um, is um, giving a uh, view of the technical uh, differences. Maybe I just showed this slide. Uh, there's all kinds of technical ways to talk about God with regard to cognitive frameworks. But maybe I'll start out, uh, and I will start out with um, the um, tentative findings I've made in preparing this video. Just uh, what is that all about, you know, from a personal human point of view? Uh, before I start, I just want to remember uh, to pray to God uh, along with you or aside you. Uh, just because um, I ought to em emphasize that uh, this God I speak of is not uh, just some object to talk about theologically, but this is a real God who's got to be respected and who has to be, um, you know, without whom these things are immensely dangerous uh, because we just be so misled, uh, but also because... Um, also, this just natural joy, this friendship with God to say, hey, look, we're, look how far we've gotten, you know, and look who's with us, right? So the spirit is transcending this screen, right? It's just, it's, it's, it's uh, reaching across and it's got to reach back, hopefully. That's what we're hoping for, right? That uh, there be a spirit. So when the goal of um, Math 4, wisdom, is to foster a scientific community, that has to be a community in the spirit. Uh, that's how I understand it. Uh, where um, 
where we can let go of ourselves and we can embrace others and then they can let go of themselves and embrace us. And, and so we have this flickering of the Holy Spirit. And I think that's one of the very attractive things about science, right? That there, there can be, there is a community. And I think that's one of the maybe sad things uh, about the limitations of science, that we see how science is kind of oppressed uh, and fits into these academic constraints and in these funding constraints. And uh, uh, people really can't be themselves at a, a certain point uh, sometimes in science. Uh, but, but uh, of course, it's a fantastic, lovely, wonderful thing. So a lot of times, another example, just to say, um, maybe one reason why the Bible is important uh, is the Hebrew Bible, including, is just because uh, when I think of a nation of independent thinkers or a culture of independent thinkers, you know, we do have paradigms. And one paradigm is the Jewish nation. Just incredible. Like, you know, it's a nation of marginalized independent thinkers uh, who are united in a culture under enormously varying circumstances and in great pain often, you know. And, and so, but what great... Um, what great or horrible insights, you know, into the nature of God, the nature of life, uh, but but wonderful, beautiful insights. And, you know, what a rich heritage, what a civilization that such a nation uh, can be very similar to Black Americans. Black Americans are a civilization, right? Because there's just more subcultures there than you could possibly, uh, you know, kind of piece together in one lifetime, and they all fit together. So obviously the same for the Jewish uh, people. Uh, but do you wonder, like, um, is the is there a French civilization, or is it just kind of homogeneous? You know, is there a Russian civilization, or is it just one big nation, right? One big culture. Those are... So if we could have a nation of independent thinkers, hopefully it's not just one culture, but many subcultures, just a beautifully explosive uh, eternal life of people shared by a uh, value of growing forever, learning forever. So um, in putting this together, uh, let's look over these tentative findings, but you know, using these cognitive frameworks that I do. Uh, so you, if you've watched the video, if you've seen more math for wisdom videos you probably know the abcs it's the twosome threesome foursome we'll see that in a couple of slides uh, review that but uh, this is the foursome of four levels of knowledge whether what how why and so that's a natural way to think about what's going on here in these different definitions and so i've kind of unified uh, the, the threads here and i had gone over my notes about uh, humans you know i have just thousands of pages of notes that I just kind of put together and assemble that's one of the discovery processes uh, of the limitations of my mind. Um, but so um, I went through that with human recently, and it's very tentative, but this group together, and then there's corresponding ways of thinking about God. And so they kind of fall. This is where that's coming from. So on the most basic level, the weather uh, level, uh, what actually is, let's say, that maybe we can't even see here, but just what we posit as what actually is, well, God is self-standing, I think. God doesn't need us in a certain sense. Uh, and God doesn't need this world. Really, God God can just be of God's self. Right? I'll sometimes slip into uh, male, he, you know, but not to say that, uh, but I think of God as uh, genderless and genderful in all things, right? So maybe I'll say she sometimes, maybe I'll say he. But, uh, I wouldn't want to say it's not, not as respectful, maybe. Um, so, Humans, uh, you know, kind of like we're different than God. <laughs> I think that, that, you know, if people, I think that that's something. Maybe the point of this video is that that difference is important. You know, it's interesting and it's very, uh, ele how can I say, uh, elevating, right? We're not God, but we're close. <laughs> you know, they're so close. So one thing is that you know, humans, uh, when you go that, what is human? It's that we have relationship with God. You know, which maybe. We can ignore God, you know, however we like. But that really elevates us. That dignifies us. Uh, and that's uh, that means that even if we're not God, you know, we have kinship with God. But so kinship is relationship, right? That that's a very treasureful thing. Um, maybe just to say, like, well, when we say human, when I say human, like, what am I talking about, right? I'm not really talking about human beings, although I think that would help to include all human beings, huh? 
But uh, if there's dolphins out there, you know, or if there are uh, maybe orangutans or um, extraterrestrials or some kind of weird spirits, you know, what are the conditions? Uh, I would think that that's human. We'll go through what human means and then you'll be able to picture like whether artificial intelligence, you know, when can it be human or when can it not? Uh, also, uh, you know, are we always human? Uh, certainly, like with regard to consciousness, uh, if you read the, if you saw the preliminaries, you you saw how I spoke about consciousness. That this, uh, we have this uh, three selves, uh, so to speak. We have the unconscious that knows the answers. We have these that's able to step out and say, "Hey, like, uh, I don't know. You know, I have a question, but I want two answers. I want three answers. I want four answers." And then we have a controller like a decider a consciousness that's able to choose which one to listen to so of course those two voices are very balanced kind of like our left and right hemisphere but there's something that's able to decide which way to go that would be the consciousness so but just to my point being that uh, that consciousness is like a flickering flame like most of the time we're not really conscious you know we're not making those decisions we're not uh, consciousness is kind of like on hold, you know, we're just going robotically through our motions, right? I'm talking to you, but, you know, kind of like things I want to say, and then I'm saying them, right? And how conscious is that? It's just kind of part of like motor mouth, right? So, uh, so a person who had no control over themselves, right? They're not really conscious, even though they may be quite uh, interesting, impressive, or even friendly, you know, perhaps. Um, although friendliness comes from adjusting, and so adjusting comes, in a certain sense, consciousness is kind of internal adjusting, right? And when you're able to sense that the other party is internally adjusting, it means a lot, right? So a little bit why I kind of, why do I do these kind of like different approaches, etc., with math for wisdom? Why is it kind of creative when no one's asking for that? Uh, why are there uh, things that kind of more about what I want to do, maybe a little bit, sometimes maybe we'll do things that people really want to know more about, but the fact is, is that to show uh, this kind of like uh, multifacetedness, uh, you know, that I am not, you know, that I'm real, right, in some real sense. Um, so, um, you know, a baby is a baby conscious sometimes, right? It's a beautiful thing, right? Like you get this little flickering, this flickering of the light, but it turns off, you know? And so by these uh, rules or by these models, like if you love somebody, right, like if you love a puppy, Right. I mean, if you love a baby, you can help support its consciousness because you can help balance it. Like you can, when it's stepped out, you can step in. You can step in so it steps out, but you can step out so that it steps in. You have this flickering of the Holy Spirit, you know, from the step in, step out, step in. It's just bouncing around. I know about that from uh, my friend Shu Hong, if you see the video with him. Uh, but uh, he is from a Christian village in China. It's very interesting. They have Christian villages. <laughs> And when he came over to San Diego, we were uh, roommates at UCSD, but uh, I went several times with him, uh, maybe more than several, to his uh, Chinese church uh, Bible studies. And there would be, uh, I didn't understand very much, it was in Chinese, you know, I was trying to learn a bit. But you could sense how the attention uh, flickers, right? Like, so that somebody is talking, you know, they've read the passage. And then someone is sharing about their lives and how what it inspires them to say. And then everyone is kind of step out. But then somehow, then somebody else steps in, you see, and everyone else steps out. And then they else. And so there's this kind of like, you don't know what's going to happen. So there's something above and beyond, right? In a different plane, right? Like this kind of, and you get to be a part of that. It's very exciting. Um, if you, just a general rule about life, <laughs> just... <laughs> You can see why I wasn't that never a teacher because I didn't want to. It affects the personality, but I'll teach you something about life. Huh? That, um, oh, you know, the most interesting things in life are typically like the most boring things. Like going to Chinese church Bible study. That's probably like on the list of like the most boring things <laughs> that you could do, right? But then to realize that's probably like one of the most interesting things. You learn something there, really fascinating, right? Like watching squirrels, you know, it's kind of boring, maybe, you know. But that's how you learn things, right? Doing math is super boring, right? But that's how you learn things that are very interesting. But you never learn anything interesting from doing interesting things. Like watching movies, you know, what did you ever learn watching movies? I don't know. Not really. Okay. So 
let's go on. Okay, so what? The level what? Which would be like your sensory input. Like, what's the sensory image of God? So, like, when we believe in God, that's weather. But, like, what do we believe in? We don't even know what this God is, right? And so that's, of course, that's why these things are so murky. They have to be murky if they're if they're beyond the sensory knowledge, right? But we're positing it, right? So you believe in God. What's the God that you believe in? Some kind of self-standing God, right? But level of what? Like, what, what is it that we experience, right? So there's this... Um, I think it is this uh, investigatory spirit which goes beyond itself into itself because there's nowhere else to go. It has to go into. And just briefly, uh, this will probably come up more and certainly in other videos. Uh, this won't be the only thing I'll ever have to say about God. But um, the basic dynamics for God is if you're self-standing, well, what happens, right? And uh, I think the only thing that could possibly happen is this question of like, am I necessary, you know? Would God be if God was not? You see, because for God, who's self-standing, being and not being, it's all the same. It's just words. There's no difference, right? But being necessary means that even if you weren't, you still are, right? And that immediately divides everything into two perspectives, like a proof by contradiction. So if there's a God, then there's a God. But if there isn't a God, then it's God. You know, still got to be a God. God's got to somehow arise. And so that division, and then in that case, you definitely have God, because it doesn't matter which way you start, you end up with God. But see, that's a very natural thing for us in terms of the spiritual and the physical. So in the spiritual world, it's kind of dull, you know, you just presume God, and then you end up with God, and it's not very interesting. But in the physical world, you know, we live in a godless world, like God has done everything to kind of remove himself from the physical world. And I think if we don't start with that... If you don't have that coldness of relationship, you know, just kind of say, hey, like, there's no God that I see around here, right? Then how could you get knowledge? But like, if about the real God, right? But I think it's just an honest thing. And that's why scientists are very nice. There's a lot of honesty in science, uh, you know, up to, up to, maybe up to a degree, but but certainly a lot. And they say, you know, we don't see anything here, right? But the idea is, is that, well, from this godless world, there should somehow emerge god in some way and then that becomes like a, a role for us right as part of that process and so that doesn't say that there is god inside. but this is talking about like how can i possibly imagine things right and i think that my imagination i i don't think is different than your imagination as far as the fundamental limits go but correct me you know leave comments it'd be interesting the things i'm saying don't really uh differ across religions i am um born and raised a catholic um uh, not practicing right now. There's a whole different story for that. But, you know, I practiced for many years. Uh, probably stopped about uh, five years ago. Uh, and that's between me and God. <laughs> It'll be a different story. In another video, I'll tell you. But um, uh, but so the Catholic uh, dogma, I have not uh, any issue with, you know, I think in, in terms of the theological things, right? Like the Trinity, you know. Uh, but I'll talk about the Trinity in ways where Muslims... Uh, find reasonable and acceptable and maybe correct you know in some in some sense certainly not objectionable so that's why it's important like we have different people from different perspectives different religions hopefully oh, i'm talking to the future people <laughs> you are so important for your testimony right to me like you know in creating this uh, in developing creating is probably the wrong word but well it's more discovering you know or trying wanting to discover this uh shared conceptual language uh of cognitive frameworks uh this is um Working together, we need these different points of view. And the things I talked about in the preliminary video, um, those are bottom up. I think those are just hopefully at some point they'll just be undeniable. I and mean, it's just kind of like, you know, that they're in the way that physics is basically in a certain sense undeniable on some levels in terms of what the experimental results are. You know, that uh, interpretations may vary, but the results are results. And uh, so this video is important because uh, I'm giving a top-down picture of like where my life has led me, where these frameworks have led me. Are there other ways to put these things together, you know, and why are the merits of those other ways? Um, what are the faults of this way? Very important. And so these are called calling tentative. So this idea in this proof of God, and just everything starts to spill out. All these cognitive frameworks that I talked about last time, they just come out naturally. The uh seven days of creation actually six and then seven right and then uh, you have i say so you go back to zero it's part of this uh eight cycle of divisions of everything you know so god being related to the zero 
that I think is, uh, you know, it's not a, um, that's not what I'm basing this on, but I think it's a nice confirmation. If you look for scripture, these things are of the spirit. They can be, they, they find confirmation that this is on the right track. This says much more, you know, than that. I think that's the point is that uh, you can say what you want based on Genesis, but do you understand what they're talking about? But when you say, no, each day is division of everything and I know how they're related and I can tell you, et cetera. Then that's very cool. That uh, it's beautiful. It's just a, you know, when you don't get encouragement from people, it's very nice to get encouragement from God, you know, in whatever form. And that's a beautiful form. Um, you know, I digress. So what I wanted to say, though, is that like the next stage, you know, so you have this division of everything into two perspectives. But then what happens? OK, so you have um, how, you have God arising in this physical world, let's say. You know, you have the original God, the self-standing God, but then you have God arising. Now, how do they know they're the same God? And it's the same God. So you have a God who understands. Understands basically means to separate, you know. And then you have a God who comes to understand, who figures it out. Hey, I'm God. You know, you're God. I'm God. Like, and how do they know they're the same God? Because they understand the same thing. There's the same understood. And so the idea is that, like, there's this tiny little God out there. Hey, you've got to be good. Yeah, we, that's what Jesus is all about, I think, right? Like, but... How is Jesus and God the same God? Because there's this lens, this gigantic lens that says, look, if you have a lens of the right shape, then the tiny thing becomes equal to the big giant God. Say, so, okay, I'll be good if you really want me to be good. What else can I do? You know, if you insist and I can't get around it. So, and that's the spirit, you know, so they both, the spirit is the shared understanding. It's this shared lens. So who could object to this kind of description? It's not talking about how things are. It's just saying that like, that's the limits of my mind. You know, that's how I understand. Like, that's how, that's how it works. You know, you have a, and so it just goes on from there. Um, for example, that distance between um, the original God and then this uh, God in there, like first it's, let's say nothing and then something and then anything and then everything. But then this process of going beyond its, God beyond himself, you know, as they say, transcendence, right? So when God transcends, but the way he, there is no self. So he has to go inside his self. He creates a self. That self is everything, basically. God is a spirit. Everything is a structure. But then you have this tiny little God in there, right? And so then that uh, God uh, goes, reaches out, say, hey, you know, you're my God. Like, and so kind of climbs back out. So that God, you know, that inside us transcends itself by going beyond itself, out of itself. So you get this kind of twofold periodicity, which I suspect is uh, both periodicity that's the twofold for the complex uh, vector spaces. Whereas the eight cycle that we've talked about before is the bot periodicity for the real vector spaces. That's the one that gives our states of minds. And so this idea that you can elevate, you can pop up out of that uh, and I think I had a re set of recent ideas. I keep working on this, but you know, I, the plus one, the sh when you're shifting in this eight cycle, plus one is the unconscious, plus two is second level of reflection, it's the conscious, and then plus three is consciousness. And then what happens with plus four? And you'll see why I'll be talking about there should be a plus four, but you pop out of the system. See, and then you're you're not really in the system anymore. And then you can pop back in. You can have this chains of understanding back and forth. So this is just a kind of initial saying, like, what is God? So God is this investigator, and what does that look like? You know, and how everything's spilling out of God's investigation. And then what is human? Well, human uh, is this misunderstanding, I guess I could say. Like, if God's all about understanding, human can kind of start to creep in in this gap, right? So there's God who understands, and then there's God who figures it out right who comes to understand hey like what's going on here like there's got to be a god you know and 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 that i have kinship with that god and in a perfect kinship i am god you know so uh so the god's kind of you know there's my responsibilities and my duties what i need to be doing uh who i need to be living on behalf of etc who i need to be choosing over myself so you see but before that god there's this like gap i mean there in that gap like there's this thing like Someone could be in that situation, but make the wrong choices, let's say, or just be in the process, right? Or whatever it is. So that's the situation we're in. Where uh, Genesis has a nice thing where the, it's nice, it's probably not the right word, uh, where uh, the, the snake, right, tempts Eve and says, if you eat the fruit, 
you will be like God. You see, it's a very interesting temptation because uh, we aren't like God. Like, you know, we are God in the sense that um, God is a creator. You see, we are creators. We're co-creators. But that's the point. It's not that we're creations. You see, people say we're in the image of God. I think, you know, we're creations of God. Like, I think that that's, or even in the image of God, like the misunderstanding of what the point is. The point is, no, we're co-creators. See, it's not about what we're like or, or how, you know, it's about, you know, we're children of God means like Jesus said, uh, you know, you do what your parents uh, do, right? Like, so if the frog jumps, baby frogs jump. Right. If you're a child of Abraham, you do what Abraham does. Maybe you have faith, right? But if you're a child of God, uh, then you do as God does. You know, God. But even more, uh, if you're the son of God, right? It's not that just you do what God does because you're a frog child, <laughs> God child. No, it's because uh, God gives you an example. He teaches you, pulls you aside. Hey, I'm going to teach you by example, right? So the son of God is the one who learns from God's example, right? The son of man, you see, how does man deal with man? Man makes an example out of somebody. That's why we're on the periphery, right? You want to make examples out of us. That's why they raised him up. That's what's going to happen to you if you're a good person. You're too good. You're too good. So you're going to die because you were too good. See, so they made an example out of him. So that's the relationship. Like he's a son of man. They made an example out of him. They taught him by making an example out of him. So, so th th these are clues, you know, from the Bible. It's very healthy to think about. But I digress. So the key thing that seems to be the issue, though, is that humans are in this gap. Uh, that's how we arise. Like, and so there's a Jesus kind of like, or you know, little God. Lithuania would say like, well, like a, I think the Kabbalah has things like this. I'm not into that, but you know, there's some kind of shard of God inside of us, right? And then there's big God out there. It's the same God, right? But we're this obstacle, right? and we're in this gap, and we're kind of like this misunderstanding, like, you know, and we're kind of lost, you know, so we see ourselves, you know, God was before his self, so maybe the relationship's clear, like, you know, but we aren't before ourselves, we came maybe with ourselves, right, and so this idea that, hey, we should learn to not be attached to ourselves, right, and what's the choice? If we're not attached to that, we have to transcend ourselves, what are the other choices of God we're beyond ourselves? So that's what human is, I would say. There's at least that theme. Now, uh, how human is, okay, and how God is. Well, so in that, so we're this uh, choosing, always choosing, you know, in all kinds of ways. Very fascinating. It's very interesting. And this will be, uh, there'll be a whole video on these eightfold frameworks. If you've been watching the videos on bringing peace to Russia and Ukraine, uh, on the, how do I know I'm not a robot, on these counter questions, uh, those will also be like, uh, they're about intelligence, but also they can be about wisdom, where uh, you you choose the good over yourself, over you choose God over yourself, right? Uh, that's that's what wisdom's all about. But we're always choosing, um, or at least uh, doing plenty of it. That's the difference between us and angels, you see. And I just deduce this, but... Um, and they say, like, a uh, human is a little bit less than the angels. Maybe that Paul said that, uh, St. Paul. But the issue is this, you see. Why don't we, why doesn't anybody convert the angels, right? There's nothing in the Bible that says, oh, and then they converted the angels. So the presumed answer is that, well, they can't change their minds. You see, when angels decide, like, they had one choice and they chose for all time. See, but that's not our situation. So we can change our minds at any moment. You know, it's very interesting, and we're we're always building this up. So, so that would be the difference between uh, you know. How, so an angel is not human in that sense. Uh, an angel could be like our deepest value, though. You know, it's like like a guardian angel. Like so, if my deepest value is living by truth, right? There could be an angel living by truth. You know, it was, it was kind of like, but I am the one who matters because I'm the one who's developing a living thing. But somehow like this kind of crystal focus point, like what does that mean? You know, but of course what it means, living by truth, it, 
uh, it means by for me it means like living by absolute truth and just goes on and on and on like a star in the sky it'll become ever more brighter like and clear like my all of my personality revolves around that certainly and each of us has a deepest value in life we may not be mature enough even to know much about it but um, but many the independent thinkers certainly are and they can say that's kind of like a, a way to clarify are you an independent thinker or are you not in my practice as an organizer of independent thinkers is that that's a very suitable line to I mean, the first uh, most basic one is like, do you return to your thoughts and collect them? Are you just looking at life as television? <laughs> you know? Or are you saying, I'm going to remember that. And then, you know, I don't want to think about that. I'm going to think about that. So if you have a, if you start collecting your thoughts, then you're on the path of independent thinking. So, okay. So human is making these choices. That's how we function. Uh, and then the God, how God functions, is just God is just a spirit rooted beyond system, right? But permeating everything it's the struck it's the spirit of everything so it's just permeating, but rooted beyond and so that's basically the effect of god say i'm here when you need me right and i'm all around you right uh, my good friend uh he, he's uh, died about five years ago but he's a sculptor algebra zolkaitis here in lithuania he his sculptures were like i call them positively deranged <laughs> just super creative in a weird weird way like you know kind of like mantras, but always kind of like something positive about them, like a positive soul. Uh, he would write poetry and he was very much like, you just kind of do it spontaneously in the mornings and then uh, sometimes about God, sometimes about devil, sometimes about both. So he had a very short poem I love. It was, Dievas Vesur, Valnes Shale, Rinkish Mogel, Tavu Vala. It means, God is everything. The devil is beside you. You human Jews. Uh, it's your will. So not much about the devil in this talk because um, not really relevant. You know, the strategy is focus on positive, focus on God. So there's not really much. But uh, certainly when you go to an uh, evil system, I was in the Soviet Union for a summer in 1980. You know, I was in 87, you know, new Lithuanian dissidents uh, see how the KGB works. You see that like evil is very real. And then just this theoretical whole dimension of like the evil, you know, et cetera, like it, it, it has some kind of, uh, you know, it's it's not not there, you know, not very interesting for, really not relevant for our, our purposes, uh, not very much because uh, we take it to God, right? So I think that's what the, that's what this is about in a mature uh, theology, I would say. I make that claim. So, um, and the mature theology would be the one that says that God doesn't have to be good. You know, life isn't fair. That's the whole point. We'll get to that. Um, so why, what's the whole point of all this? You know, when, so we look at it from why, it would say, well, God is where things are coming out of. That's the source of diversions. Everything's spilling out of God. But human is the point of unity. You know, human is where, where how it all comes together. And it's coming together in eternal life, in eternal growth, in some eternal expanse, right? We'll talk more about that. But so these are just, uh, this is the picture where it's coming from. I hope it's not too, I think it could, could include a lot of things, but maybe place a lot of worldviews into a little bit, you know, push them to say, hey, like, are you really talking about the whole of life? Are you really talking about everything? You know, are you really talking about God uh, or human in a, in, a, in a full sense? So it's a challenge, you know. But it's, I don't think it, I can't really say, like, what am I saying here that, uh, but I, of course, it's tentative, and so I can grow, teach me, I want to know. But I am I feel good at being able to share this. So this is kind of like a conclusion so far. Now, this is where it gets technical, right? So everything I said was just kind of riffing on preparing for this video. But um here are the technical definitions we'll run through, and, you know, probably try to get myself to be running and not walking because it takes forever if we just walked. And also, you know, I only know things so much. So but we'll start off kind of like with the self sent in God, which is the indefinite, right? And then how does that relate to the definite and then the imaginable and the unimaginable, most basic level. And this notion of God beyond conditions and human within conditions. Uh, and uh, God, uh, what does it mean, uh, these levels of um, spirit and structure and um, representations and unity? So in that sense, like God is the spirit of everything. I mean, 
when you say like God is love, uh, what that would mean technically is that uh, you know love is the unity of the representations of the structure of God. So love is the essence of God in that sense. So that's a technical statement. We'll be able to look at. It. And the same setup is what allows humans to choose self versus God, choose uh, life versus eternal life. And then we'll see uh, this sets things up for investigations uh, how, that God does, as we kind of already said, and what human does. Because human is kind of trying to deal with our existential situation. And so that's question of climbing. How do we climb out of this world? You know, what's our, what are the things that help us kind of climb out? I'll just list them basically there. Uh, the notion of eternal life, uh, wisdom, uh, goodwill, God's will. So we'll do that. And uh, in God's investigations, you have these chains of perspectives. It's like uh, through persons. So God is the zeroth person. Then you have I, first person, you, second person, other is the third person. So God is kind of removing himself through these stages, through these people. And so very special role for the other right, in a certain sense that we unify around. So when I say unifying around persons, there's a notion of other that kind of unifies us all, that we care about, that the person not in the room, right, who is not in the room where it happened, that that's the person that's most important, right. And then, uh, but humans, we're in a different perspective. So, you know, we are different from God, you know, so we have our perspective and we our understanding for us is our perspective of God's perspective. And then it goes back and forth, you know, of our perspective, of God's perspective, of our perspective. You have understanding, self-understanding, shared understanding, good understanding. These are things I sung about in the intro introduction to Math for Wisdom, the very first video, which maybe someday people will enjoy <laughs> uh, or just be fine, fascinating. Um, or maybe the remake will be better than the original. So... God is like a zeroth person um, beyond all perspectives, looking through us, looking through all these people by which God investigates through I, through you, through other. Uh, but um, we are, especially this other, is within all perspectives. It's the ground for this unity of everybody. You know? So uh, so some of the types of questions God asks, like, you know, how does he reach out to everybody? You know, that's something he could be asking us, you know, because we need to be, the way this is imagined or set up is like, you know, God needs our help to reach other people. And God's necessity hinges on every single person. And it's not a, it's an open-ended basically thing in terms of the, in the way that eternal life is open-ended. It's exciting. And so eternal life is not about the afterlife. Eternal life is about uh, living forever here and now, right? And then transcending this life by living forever. So just in the way like your deepest value has this angelic transcendence, you know, that could never be destroyed, right? Um, so that takes on a reality of its own, that there's a reality that's just greater than whatever could be happening here, and we're jumping on or we're recognizing our place in that. Then, um, in terms of our understanding of God, uh, this idea, I had mentioned like how God separates him, is separate from himself by different scopes, nothing, something, anything, everything, is the gap between uh you know, and you can see how it kind of relates to these persons, you know, God, I, you, other. So like God, between God and God, there's, there's nothing. But like once God is, this Jesus is inside the I, right? Well, then there's uh, something that, uh, and then, then it goes into you. There's anything that's the difference and then goes into this other. Like there's this everything that's the difference between those perspectives. You know, there's a gap actually at that point, a very important gap. Um, But the deal being that uh, God can be, have these, con we can conceive of God or uh, God, uh, I used to call them representations, but uh, because inspired by math, uh, but uh, I think we gotta be careful uh, just to maybe not use mathematical terms for philosophical <laughs> issues. So I just call them conceptions, uh, but we can conceive of God as wishing for nothing. He's self-sufficient, wishing for uh, something. He's uh, certain, wishing for Anything, God is calm, wishing for everything, God is loving, right? She's loving. No, no, it's a he, it's whatever. Uh, but so humans, uh, we have uh, reservations in Lithuanian, I would say, not wishes or anti-wishes, right? We don't wish, we don't wish because it's just hard enough as it is. You know, God wishes for nothing, self-sufficient, but we wish not for nothing. Like we have needs, uh, which and operating principles for satisfying them. 
and uh, God wishes for something is certain, but we have like minds with doubts, you know, we have bodies with needs, minds with doubts. Uh, God wishes for anything is calm, but we have uh, expectations, uh, hearts with expectations, uh, emotions. And um, God wishes for everything is loving, but we don't wish for everything. We got this value that we're going to focus on, you know, and that uh, we're going to grow, grow with and go with and uh, maybe transcend even somehow. Take it to the limit. So those are our values. Uh, and how do we transcend that? Maybe with, uh, I'm not so clear how to call that, some kind of trials maybe or questions. And then technically a very important way that uh, we think about God that's just built into this eight cycle. That's very important um, in uh, discussing the preliminaries. Eight cycle of divisions of everything is that there's a division of everything into zero perspectives. Uh, I call the null sum. And that's about issues of God, you know, that are just basically outside when there's no perspectives, but there's still this idea that refers to God. So if you're a materialist and you have a brain and you have a global workspace and your brain models itself and it has a model of its what they call the global workspace, then to say, well, that workspace could be divided into one part or two part or three part or four part. But in that model, the model could say, I have a model of the global workspace, but I have a meta level that I model above it, right? There's no perspective. There's no divisions. I just kind of detach myself from that. I have a little corner, you know, where I pray, <laughs> a little chamber in my mind, you know, where I can just get out of my... Uh, so that says there must be... There's got to be a neurological model, you know, where the brain is modeling itself, plus a little extra chamber where it says, I've decided not to divide everything. into things. just kind of like, I'm in the extra mode, you know. Uh, so... But why, you know, see who's going to find that neurologically? They can't find that. But just systems requirements show it's probably got to be there, right? So that's why um, this is a cheaper way to kind of investigate all that. But the sixth sum is about humanity, morality. And I think um, what probably happens is that, the, you know, the mind can introspect six perspectives. Maybe that's part of the reason why. Because when you get to seven perspectives, uh, you have a full fledged system. You have the ability to divide perspectives. You know, there exists a good, there exists a bad. You have the ability to uh, have a self-standing logical system. You have the framework for slack. And slack is the spirit of good. So I'm sorry, I got that the other way around. Good is the spirit of slack. Slack is the structure of good. So when you're in that logical system and you're reflecting, uh, you're in the mode of reflection, you can see yourself as the sixth sun. So that's the max that we see ourselves maxed out would be like this humanity. But the, but the thing goes on, it collapses and it returns and etc. So we'll look then um, at the um, we'll look at the uh, con two conceptions of the sixth sun and um, they're in terms of how human internalizes um, perspectives and then how God immortalizes our um, positive emotions like love into virtues like hope. So, for example, duty is something external. It's an external perspective. But caring is an internal perspective. They basically mean the same thing. Except that, you know, when you care, you've internalized duty. Okay, And if you do that, then what God will do... When you have positive feelings of intimacy that there's only inside, there's no uh, outside possible, then that will be immortalized in the virtue of honesty. It's a technical thing. You'll see the structure, but it's quite beautiful. It's about the meaning of life. There's three versions of that. The, the one's due to St. Paul, of course, but there's one due to Plato, and there's one due to... I'll take credit for it. And then finally... Um, this is why this is all in preparation for future discussion of uh, research updates. I realize I need to be able to refer back to this uh, these overview. But um, I'll mention that uh, God's investigations proceed through 24-fold sciences. Beautiful structures. You've basically seen uh, these, uh, like if you've seen the video on the... Um, uh, surface structure versus deep structure, and you've seen the picture of the 24 ways of figuring things out in mathematics. Basically, that same thing is happening in different levels for God, for I, for you, for other. 
And the human, meanwhile, is investigating in terms of uh, eternal life regarding the needs, um, wisdom regarding the doubts, uh, goodwill regarding the expectations, and God's will regarding the um, values. Uh, so uh, that's this human kind of eightfold thing where like an eightfold framework lets us transcend our sixfold uh, mind, say, or limitations, basically. We're not really sixfold mind, but we have a lim you know, limited ability to introspect. It's the sixfold, I think, which is pushing it. <laughs> but um, so these eightfold frameworks are frameworks uh, that are very practical. It'll be a separate video about them. And also one about the 24-fold sciences. And so my research currently is like, how do you take a science for everything, which is like the first person's point of view. And it's basically all about like what makes meaningful experiences. And how does that relate to wisdom and uh, intelligence, right? Where's the wisdom that in meaningful experiences? Uh, I don't know how that all fits together, but I have lots of um, data uh, from meaningful experience in my own life. And I have, uh, I have um, these important frameworks that need to be refined and improved. And, you know, hopefully it'll be interesting. You know, we keep looking, where does math uh, help us uh, make sense of all these things or kind of like clarify these things? Well, 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 I've taken a lot of time talking. And I know that uh, if I keep continuing, I'll go on for two or three hours. So uh, I think, um, also, I think my energy will go down. It's nice to have a lot of energy. So what, when I do this, uh, I will just uh, dash through the slides just so that you know uh, what you're missing if you, or what you're choosing to miss if you're... Um, going through this thing, but you know, at least you'll have seen the slides. Uh, this is going from the indefinite to the definite to the imaginable to the unimaginable. Uh, then I, I am fascinated like with the connection with uh, what our math are called uh, exact sequences. Okay, and so I, I'll talk about how they relate to uh, the divisions of everything. And especially a short exact sequence uh, appears to relate to the levels of knowledge, which would make a lot of sense. Uh, and I'll be working on a, um, video about the Yonei dilemma, if you've heard about that, uh, or you'll learn about that, uh, how that functions as a knowledge switch. So it's very cool that it could uh, connect with the short exact sequences and with, uh, for example, the Yates index theorem in the uh, recursive function theory. This is very big. Um, this is the equation of life. And basically, so God doesn't have to be good. Uh, Life isn't fair. Uh, the way maybe to say it is that, you know, God is beyond conditions. Good is God within conditions. Life is the fact that God is good, but eternal life is understanding, uh, separating that uh, God doesn't have to be good, which is to say life isn't fair. There's this gap that ends up happening. Okay, so that's, that's how it works. Uh, and so here uh, you have these chains of perspectives, like I was saying, where God looks through I and then through you and then through other. Whereas for human, you go back and forth, um, looking through God and through human and through God and back to human. These levels of understanding. And here are these wishes that I talked about. Uh, you know, these are properties of God. And this I'll need to talk more about, uh, which is why we'll need to make another video. But... Uh, the idea being that um, that uh, equation of life, you know, that God doesn't have to be good, life isn't fair, uh, which relates God, good, life, and eternal life. There's four levels of thinking about that. That's on the level of the spirit, but then we can look at the level of structure, which is to say, you know, everything is the structure of God. Slack is the structure of good. Anything is the structure of life. Wisdom is the structure of eternal life. So saying anything is everything plus slack a little bit of freedom, so you could have focus on anything. Um, but wisdom is separating, you know, what is everything and what is the slack? What is the whole and what is the looseness? And then uh, these have conceptions. So everything has four conceptions, the four wishes I talked about. Slack, like if, you, if your shoelaces have slack, well, there's two ways to conceive that, uh, because you can't conceive it statically, but you have to be, conceive it dynamically. So either the slack is increasing or the slack is decreasing seeing it's tightening, uh, which is probably bad, but it's still same slack, right? We tend to think loosening is probably thought of as good, you know. Um, 
depending on the context. Uh, so anything, the, the two and the four, um, there make six choices, okay? Uh, but then you go beyond that. Uh, you can choose, so you can choose yes, you can choose no, you can choose uh, not yes, you can choose not no, you can choose to choose, you can choose to not choose. But I think the two more are that uh, you could just be choosing, right? Or you could be not choosing, see? So those are kind of like godly. Uh, and so taken all together, you get the directions of the goodwill, uh, to goodwill, from goodwill. We'll talk about that. Then when you unify that, um, so when we had the wishes, the most expansive was love. And actually being, you know, love itself uh, is the one that pulls together, unites all those uh, four wishes. Perfection is the thing that unites the increasing slack and the decreasing slack, these two identities. Uh, uh, the will is the essence of the human life, right? That the will loves the perfect, um, uh, that, um, yeah, we love the perfect. But see, God loves the imperfect. That's why God is godlier than us, right? So this is very important. And then to talk about goodwill, I have to go through the emotional responses. This is the eightfold structure that relates to uh, uh, the expectations. And uh, so extends calmness, extends peace of God, right? into the different uh, emotional responses that we have. And then that relates to the ways of showing goodwill. This is kind of tentative needs work, but it's very, anyways, it's, it helps make it more concrete. Then finally, um, our favorite uh, eightfold uh, cycle uh, of divisions of everything. And then we have these three shifts. And so when we remember that, you know, we can say, oh, well, remember what the null sum is and the one sum, right? The division of everything into no perspectives, the division of everything into one perspective. Uh, so that's for God and for everything. Uh, they have very, uh, they have four conceptions each. Uh, so uh, true, direct, constant, significant are um, the conceptions of the null sum. And one nice fact about them is that uh, they're negations of the four levels of knowledge. They negate whether, what, how, why. So that's very interesting. They're kind of keeping us out of that little chamber in the mind that, uh, you know, that's a little meta chamber in the mind. Um, then there's uh, four conceptions of the one sum. So if you remember the properties of everything from the preliminaries uh, video, that uh, everything has uh, no external context, uh, no, uh, it accepts all things, it has no filter, it has no internal structure, it's a required concept. Um, then uh, terms that basically say the same thing that would be relevant here, it's like, you know, God is unconditional, but human is conditional. You know, God is undeniable, but human is undeniable. God is impartial, but human is partial. God is necessary, but human is unnecessary. So, then the system for morality um, takes the three cycle, but kind of expands on it by saying, well, it could be relative to human, but it could be absolute, where you kind of can get out of the cycle by thinking absolutely. Um, and so this is a reminder of those basic uh, building block structures, because then we can look at the two conceptions. And so here's where I was mentioning uh, the structures. Uh, St. Paul's is in the middle, and then uh, Plato's is... Uh, I say beauty, um, he called it wisdom, um, but I'll explain why uh, that difference, because these are positive emotions according to this scheme. That's the best way to kind of think about it. And so if you just go through the permutations, um, there'll be in terms of intimacy. And so if you, like I said, if you convert duty into caring, then these good feelings of intimacy will be trans immortalized by you know God as a honesty. Right, that'll then that'll be this honesty that will be live forever. It transcends these moments of these beautiful moments in life that just will transcend this universe. Right, they're heavenly. So, so that would be like moments of honesty, moments of hope, moments of courage, of moments of our virtue. Those are ours. You know, not everything is God's. Right? Like we have something to glory to Ukraine, right? <laughs> glory to us. Anyways. I mean, what, you know, of course, God, I don't know. What kind of God are we talking about? So, I mean, there's so much of God here, right? You know, there's got to be a little bit, you know, for the humans too. 
So these are the structures. I think that there are two conceptions, a godly one and a humanly one. And then so to go back, wow, we didn't get very far. We didn't we didn't get to the big picture. We'll need a couple more videos to get through this material. But uh, oh, and this is the, these are the investigations. So God has four questions, human has four questions, and then um, they kind of relate back to uh, the four. Here it's saying uh, integrated subjective vantage point. Those four levels um, are um, related to the levels of knowledge, whether, what, how, why. Whereas these four are uh, related to uh, the equation of life, you know, God, good, life, eternal life. And when you put them together, uh, those four and those four would, um, I think they they basically constitute uh, the eighth cycle. There's an eightfold way, you know, they're, they're important building blocks, very primal, primeval. So then we would summarize back this. I think we'll, we won't do that. Uh, and then we can summarize back this. And then uh, we're done, I think, basically. So here's where I say goodbye. Um, please uh, like this video. You liked it. Right? Subscribe to these videos so that you can catch what we didn't talk about. And then uh, support me through Patreon. Um, but, uh, keep thinking about that, you know, because uh, at a certain point, uh, one year from now, I'll, I'll be begging for your support. Now I'm just kindly reminding you that, hey, like, this is valuable. This is something you could support. That would be meaningful, uh, I think. It's very meaningful. Why not? Um, thank you for being you. And thank you for being with me. If you made it this far, wow, that is a fluttering of the Holy Spirit. So I pray for you. Go forth and you pray for me. Right? And we pray for God. So God has, God keeps going strong. Amen.